In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Back in 1945, the United States dropped the first atomic bomb upon the city of Hiroshima, Japan, from an airplane which bore the name Enola Gay on its nose. That was the name of the mother of the pilot. I don't know how many mothers would want an atomic bomb plane named after them, but the Enola Gay dropped that bomb. A week ago this past Friday, an atomic bomb was dropped on the Catholic Church, the first atomic bomb on the church. And if there would have been a name on the nose of that bomber, it would be Francis. In fact, that's one of many headlines that I read over the past week to describe the motto proprio issued by Francis of Rome a week ago Friday. An atomic bomb upon the Catholic Church. Other headlines, and there were many, read uh, in one case, worst papal document issued in the history of Christianity. Another one was, the Pope is making war against his own church. Still another written by a bishop of the United States was uh, that the motto proprio was written with a chainsaw. In other words, it was a hack piece of writing. I could go on. And there's much I could say about Francis of Rome and this motto proprio, but I will save that for another time. I will tell you that I am working with our local bishop, and I am very hopeful that he will continue to be accommodating and generous toward the Tridentine faithful as he has shown himself to be in the past. But even apart from that, I have great hope and confidence for the present and the future because somehow this is fitting into divine providence. God is ultimately in charge. God knows what he is about. I want to go briefly over the history of this Tridentine Mass as well as its place locally because we have had a historic role in this church, in this archdiocese, and in this state and region. First of all, as many of you know, the so-called Tridentine Mass, which really means the Mass of Trent, was formally solidified in its uh, basic form that has come down through the centuries and prior to that in those uh, infamous 1500s when Protestants such as Martin Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and so many others were rebelling against the Catholic Church dismissing uh, much of the sacramental life of the Church and uh, fully rejecting the sacrifice of the Mass. And so in place of the Mass, they started their own services. Coming out of that, the Council of Trent was convened, and many definitions came forth from that, still binding, with regards to the kind and number of the sacraments and so many other aspects of Catholic life. Also coming out of that period, and specifically in 1570, Pope St. Pius V issued a bull quo primum, which is well known to traditional Catholics, in which the Pope, as declaratively as a Pope can get, formally declared the Mass, which we know as the Tridentine Mass, to be the fixed form of the Mass for the present 
and the basic form of the Mass in perpetuity. Without doubt, Pope St. Pius V was responding to the Protestant rebels of his time to fix the Mass in its form in the face of Protestant services. But divine providence was already then ensuring for the future in that the Pope's declaration included not just the present or not just until another Pope, but in perpetuity, until the end of time. And he specifically, explicitly stated in that bull that every priest has a right to offer that Mass and the faithful have the right to hear that Mass in perpetuity. That fact, that reality was affirmed by Pope Benedict XVI in his 2007 motu proprio regarding the traditional form of the Mass in which he stated that in fact that Tridentine Mass had never been abrogated and that all priests and the faithful had a right to that Mass. And he also wrote that the bishops were to assist in making that Mass available for those who desired it. That's a brief history of the Tridentine Mass, which goes back much farther in its basic form than the 1500s, but was in a particular way confirmed in perpetuity in 1570. With regards to our own local history, we are blessed to have been offering that Mass, the traditional Tridentine Mass, in this church for 40 years. An earlier pastor approached the Archbishop of the time and asked that he be allowed to offer this Mass at a time when no other diocesan churches were offering that Mass in this state or in this region diocesan parishes. There were some SSPX churches, but no diocesan churches. The Archbishop agreed to allow it once a month on First Fridays in the evening, and so it began. And then eventually the Archbishop granted that it could be done on Sundays and Holy Days as well. So for many, many years, for some decades, St. Augustine Church was the only diocesan church, in fact, publicly offering that Mass. And it served a very wide community. To this day, we still have people that drive 100 miles round trip. I remember from when I began more than 20 years ago, a man who drove 500 miles. He came from the North Dakota border to attend this Mass, the only one in the state or his region. 500 miles to attend this form of the Mass. More than 20 years ago, the pastor of the time asked if I would take over responsibility for offering this Mass on Sundays, First Fridays, and Holy Days. And I did. I learned that Mass, which had been the Mass that inspired me as a boy to become a priest. And, uh, and I loved it and have loved it ever since. And then in 2007, the motu proprio came from Pope Benedict, acknowledging the Mass had never been abrogated and that it could be offered at any time. And at that time, as pastor of this church and Holy Trinity, I immediately instituted the practice of daily Mass and multiple Tridentine Masses on Sundays and holidays. And we have continued that practice ever since. It makes us unique in this diocese, but the good news is that now there are half a dozen other churches as well that are offering the Tridentine Mass. And the reality is at a time when the hierarchy shut down our churches worldwide, the phenomenon that is now apparent is that the traditional faithful increased in number and strength. At a time when the church was literally shut down, 
And uh, many of the faithful had no access to Mass and the sacraments. The traditional movement substantially grew in strength and in number, such that we are now offering three Sunday Masses, and at this Mass have an overflow downstairs into the church hall. You now comprise almost half of my entire parish. No doubt this is why Francis has chosen now to try and destroy this Mass, because this is a phenomenon that has been going on worldwide. Coming out of a time when many expected the church to die, tradition has had a resurrection. And my hope comes not from a human hope or in any particular individual, but from God. And I want to cite briefly two great bishops who are dear friends of tradition. Bishop Athanasius Snyder has commented on this, and he brings us back to the apostolic period, described in the book of Acts, when the hierarchy was seeking to destroy the Christian movement, which at that time did not even have a name. And the Sanhedrin was debating what to do about it as the apostles were preaching Christ and Christ crucified and risen. And wise Gamaliel, a greatest rabbi perhaps of that century, the teacher of St. Paul, he rose up in the Sanhedrin and he said to the high priest, the chief priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and others, if this is of man, it will come to nothing. But if this is of God, you will not be able to stop it. And my friends, this traditional movement is of God, and no human power will stop it. It is also notable that the Sanhedrin ignored the wise advice of the rabbi Gamaliel and continued to order the apostles to cease their preaching and even imprison them. But the apostles' response was, we will obey God and not man. And so we hope for the best from our bishops in how they respond to this. But if not, I am convinced that there are priests in this diocese and worldwide who, like the apostles, will say, we will obey God, not man. And finally, I want to cite our good friend, Archbishop Vigano, who has written, again, for the church and world, a beautiful uh, essay in which he rightly tells us that we are moving into a period of the crucifixion of the church. That just as Christ himself was crucified, and then only then, shortly after, rose from the dead glorified, we are now arriving at the crucifixion of the church, which would mean that we're moving into apocalyptic times. And just as the original Christ was betrayed by the hierarchy of the time, the mystical Christ, the church, is being betrayed as well. And so it falls to each of us, in the face of this passion leading into the crucifixion, what are we going to do? Are we going to flee from Golgotha like so many did, including most of the apostles? Or are we going to stand fast underneath the cross, faithful and suffering whatever consequences we might until the end? The Blessed Mother, the Blessed Apostle St. John. We know the answer to it. We don't know what lies ahead. We don't know what the consequences are for such faithfulness to the crucified Christ and now his crucified church. But we will stand fast. And we know that the traditional Mass and tradition itself 
can never, ever be stopped because it is of God and not of man. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost.